Section number six of Astounding Story seven, July nineteen thirty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Story seven, July nineteen thirty, by Various, Earth the Marauder. Beginning a three-part novel by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter seven, Outer Space. He only proved a belief I have entertained for centuries, snarled Dalys, that all the male Sargas are fools, and the females for bearing them. Sarka said nothing, but within his breast a deep hatred was forming for Dalys. He had disliked him before, and had been abused by him, but in the busy life of Sarka there had been no time for hatred of anyone. Busy people had no time for hatreds. You should be torn to pieces for that, Dalys, was all he said. We needed my father's father in our efforts, but the loss to the word of one super genius cannot be balanced by slaying another, so you are safe. What he could do, I can do, snapped Dalys. Sarka turned away from him, seating himself beside the table of the very colored lights, and his heart was heavy as lead in his breast. He blamed Jaska for much of this, and his heart was burdened, despite her treachery, by the fact that he loved her, always would love her. Love was the one possession which made centuries of life desirable to men of the earth, for men could spend centuries in seeking a true maid, knowing that there were other centuries still in which to enjoy her. Women was man's greatest boon, his excuse for living, as was man's excuse for woman. Through the centuries, when humankind remained forever young, the joy in each other of those truly mated grew as their knowledge grew. And now Jaska had failed Sarka, when for half a century they had loved each other. Why had she done it? He had given her no reason to do so. Had there been some other reason? Why had she loved and left them, after the betrayal of the master barrel into the hands of Dalis? Before God whispered Sarka. I believe that you, Jaska, were playing a game to dupe Dalis, as he played a game to dupe us. Down in his heart he wasn't sure, but somehow just to whisper to himself his faith in Jaska gave it back to him in some measure, and by some much lightened the weight upon his heart, for now his responsibilities were greater than they had ever been before, and he had need of all his faculties. She'll come back, or somehow communicate with me, and explain everything, he told himself. But he refused to ponder on how Dalis, the betrayer, had gained possession of the secret sign manual he had believed known only to Jaska and himself. That, too, might be explained satisfactorily, for Dalis was cunning. From the side of the laboratory opposite the revolving barrel came a soft tinkling sound, like the striking of a musical bell. Sarka rose wearily, strode to the wall, where a narrow aperture opened, in which rested food capsules sufficient for one meal for three men. He smiled wryly. They knew then, the food conservers deep in the earth as they were, that Sarka the first was no more, and sent food for three men. All the world knew, perhaps, yet no single person had raised voice in protest or if any had, the mounting murmur of the barrels had drowned it out. Sarka, spoke Dalis suddenly, at what time do you estimate that the flight of the Earth in its orbit will be materially affected? It's been affected this moment, Dalis, shifting the Ovidum star, said Sarka shortly. Within twelve hours we will be in readiness to start our journey. Remaining absolutely motionless within the domed laboratory, it was now possible to feel the ever so slight motion not only of the laboratory, but of the mountain crest upon which it rested. Not so much a to-and-fro motion as a round-about motion. Just as the slightest sound flies outward through space endlessly, and the slightest vibration moves outward until the end of time and of space, Sarka knew that the vibration set up by the barrel, slight though it was, was already being felt at the poles of the earth. Not enough to be noticed there, but existent, just the same. 
In twelve hours the world will be fighting against this combined vibration and anti-gravitational force we are starting, and second by second accelerating, Sarka explained to Dalis, fighting to remain on its pathway above the sun, but we will win against it and with each new vibration, each succeeding one being more strongly felt, we will force the Earth that much more against the pool which holds it in its orbit. The laboratory was trembling. The mountain beneath it was trembling, both in accordance with scientific design. There was no element of chance in it, for the mountain moved, and the laboratory on its crest moved, as science willed. It was now difficult for Sarka to remain still where he sat, for the trembling was exciting his heart action, and causing the blood to rush to his cheeks, making him feverish. He rose to his feet and began pacing the floor. He strode to the jade lever, moved it ahead a fraction of a fraction of an inch, and perceptibly the murmuring of the barrel increased, as did the trembling of the laboratory and of the mountain. Twelve hours later exactly, Sarka shouted a single word to Dalis. Now! The laboratory was swinging about in a sort of circle, in a way that made one dizzy if one remained still for the merest second. Sarka, glancing out into the outside, across which blew the storms of the heights, and noting that no cracks appeared in the surface of the world's vast roof, knew that this swaying motion had been transmitted evenly to all the earth and that, so far at least, his calculations had been correct. But Dalis was in a cold sweat of fear, and deathly sick. The motion of the laboratory, like the inside of a whirling top, made him ill, though Sark could tell that he fought against it with all his great will. Sark strode to him, looked him in the eyes for a moment. Dalis looked back, glaring defiance. Are you afraid, Dalis? He shouted to be heard above the screaming of the master barrel. I am not afraid, croaked Dalis. Has the time arrived? Sarka paused, as though for dramatic effect, and raised his right hand high, while his left hand dropped to the metalized jade lever. There still was room in the slot in the onyx base for the lever to move forward ever so little. We have reached the exact place, cried Sarka where the Earth can, by pressure upon this lever, be continued on its orbit, or forced out of it, out into space. Which shall it be, Dallas? If I move the lever forward, we start our voyage, and may not be able to return. For a moment the nostrils of Dallas quivered as though with fear. His face was white with his illness, but out of his eyes peered the fanatic self-confidence of the man. Push it forward, Sarka, he managed. Sarka, smiling slightly, pushed the lever to its outermost limit, still with his right arm upraised. For full five minutes he stood thus, and then... Now, he shouted, bringing down his arm, we have begun our journey into space. Come, let us look outside, and await the first reports from my father. The two men, forgetting again for a moment the fact of their enmity, strode to the southern wall of the laboratory and looked out across the roof of the world. You will know, Dalis, said Sarka conversationally, that in a matter of hours the roaring of the etheric winds will possess everything. We will have passed into the infinite reaches of outer space, where, if I may make so bold as to say so, it were better if Dalis, self-named master of the world, knew whither he was going. Chapter 8 Moon Minions Prepare It's time, said Sarka softly, that we who have urged the world to forget its quarrels should forget our own. What difference who is master, so long as success attend our efforts? Then tell me your secret of control of our flight, snapped Dalis. Before Sarka could answer, however, Sarka the Second entered the laboratory area before the master barrel. He looked a question at his son, and Sarka knew that his father was asking what had become of Sarka the First. He shrugged his shoulders and nodded his head toward Dalis. 
Sarka the second gave no more sign of perturbation than had his son, but deep within his eyes was seen all fires of fury which centuries of penance on the part of Dalis wouldn't erase. But now, with Sarka the first gone, Dalis must live. We are headed, said Sarka's father softly, in the general direction of the moon. If we could travel toward it in a straight line, we would reach it if we kept our pace of about eighteen miles per second in approximately four hours. But since we are out of control, I fear we will pass it too far away for our fighters to fly across the intervening space, or we may be drawn against it in a planetary collision, which of course means annihilation. We are traveling noticeably faster than while in the Earth's orbit. I am able to see something of the preparation of Moon Man to receive us. Dalis turned to Sarka, and the perspiration bedewed his forehead. In order to make this mad mission successful, he must know Sarka's secret of control. Had he been in Sarka's place, he would have kept his secret no matter what happened, and he believed in his heart that Sarka would do the same. It never occurred to him that Sarka, no matter who the master, would divulge his secret in order to save humanity from destruction. We have approximately four hours, Dalis, Sarka prompted the betrayer. I need at least an hour for my experiments. Do you, knowing as you do that I have planned all this out, know exactly what course our voyage should take? Still insist on holding the reins yourself? I agree for this time to listen to your advice as I promised you. Then let me suggest that you do some of the work which I had planned should be done by my father's father. It's time that the world's induction conduits be placed in operation in order that our people be supplied with equable temperature from the Earth's core, as our temperature changes due to our position with relation to the Sun. Stand back and give me the controls. For a moment Daly stared at the two Sargas. Would they seize power the moment he moved away from the barrel control? In their places he knew he would have done it. In their places he knew he would never have submerged self in the good of the people but somewhat diffidently he moved away. Sarka the second returned to the observatory, behind the barrel, while Sarka stopped before the table where the lights were. After a moment of thought conversation with Sarka the second in the observatory, he dimmed the light which connected his laboratory with the headquarters of Clazer in the Americas. Clazer, he barked, for the period of one second cut the speed of every barrel within your gens to half its present speed. I obey, O oh Sarka, came the voice of Clazer. Have we changed direction? Sarka mentally questioned his father. Slightly, but we are curving away, instead of toward the moon. Try again. Sarka dimmed the light of Cleric, who instantly made answer. I'm here, Sarka. Stop the barrels of your gens for two seconds, but be prepared to speed them up immediately afterward, if ordered, to the speed at which they are now revolving. Clazer, hold the speed of your barrels as they are. I obey, O Sarka, came the musical tones of Cleric. I hear, O Sarka, replied Clazer. Now, my father, queried Sarka again, telepathically, what direction do we travel? We are heading in a direction which will cause us to pass the moon at a distance of approximately 50,000 miles, from which point our fighters can reach the moon in exactly two hours after they have passed through our atmosphere, cried Sarka exultantly aloud. True, son, replied Sarka the second mentally. I suggest you hold our course steady as it is. The motion of the earth now was as that of a steadily falling body, and the shifting of the overdom store caused by vibrations set up by the barrels had set the earth on its course toward the moon. Sarka now gave instructions to Clazer and to Cleric to return the speed of the barrels to that which they had attained at the moment the journey of the earth had begun, thus bringing them once more into harmony with the master barrel, and rendering the overdom static. Dallas re-entered the laboratory from the wall tube, near the dome exit, by which he had passed down to the lowest inner level 
and stared suspiciously at the two Sarkas. He found them half smiling their satisfaction. We passed the moon within fifty thousand miles, exulted Sarka. A flight of two hours for the gens which attacks the moon. Do you refuse, Odalis, to send your gens against the moon? Why not send the gens of Gerd? demanded Dalis. He is the youngest of the spokesmen. And what better test is there for him than this? It's because he's so young that we don't wish to send him, replied Sarka coldly. The colonization of the moon by earthlings requires the guiding genius of spokesman who has the experience of Dalis, or Sarka, else you would now be dead. Then let it be Sarka, barked Dalis. Who then will control the further flight of the earth? You! Let your father lead my gens against the moon. What will your gens say, O Dalis, that their revered spokesmen fear to lead them in person? Enough of this squabbling, snapped Sarka the second. Do you not realize that within a matter of hours some gens must be sent into battle? Come with me to the observatory, where you will be given something besides squabbling with which to occupy your minds. Leaving the Earth on its lonely flight through space, the three men hurried to the observatory, where they seated themselves before the eyepieces of the microtelescopes, whose outer circles had been aimed at the moon. For a moment the three stared breathlessly at the surface of this dead sister of Earth. They noted her valleys, her craters which seemed bottomless, and saw that even as they watched, Valleys and craters became sharper of outline, proving that they were approaching the moon at a tremendous speed. It seemed, too, as though they were heading toward sure collision, though Sarko the Second had said that they would pass the moon at a distance of fifty thousand miles. You will note activity at the very rims of the craters, said the elder Sarka easily. The craters are man-made, not volcanic, as some scientists believe, and are shaped to converge the rays of the sun, as our roof is created for the same purpose. But note the activity at the rims of the craters. Closer the man peered, studying the rims as instructed by Sarka the Second, all about them. And as they watched, activity became apparent on the inner slopes of the craters. Winged creatures seemed to be flying. They looked like tiny oblate spheroids, and they were in swift action, darting to and fro like bees which have been disturbed in their hives. Those spheres are of metal, said Sarko the Second, and they are the fighting air cars of the Moon Man. Neither Dalis nor Sarko denied this statement, for they knew it to be fact. It became apparent that the movement of the air cars wasn't a movement of chance, but as skillfully ordered as any maneuvers which had, during the last few hours, been executed by any of the gens of Earth. That they were of metal became apparent when, through the microtelescopes, the watchers caught the glint of the sun on the surfaces of the cars. Sarka did a swift mental calculation and announced the result. Those air cars average something like four hundred feet in length, and are doubtless filled with fighting moon men. That's right, said Dalis, who also had been calculated this very thing. But our ray directors will disintegrate the air cars as easily as my ray director disintegrated Sarka the First. The remaining Sarkas received this statement in silence, for Dalis' choice of a comparison had been an unhappy one, to say the least. I am wondering, said Sarka, if you, my father, and you, Dalis, have noted the peculiar appendages of the air cars. I saw them some minutes ago, said his father moodily, and I am almost afraid to guess their use, if they are what I fear they are. Then the moon men have been expecting this attack of ours for years and years, and have been preparing for it. If they have known, and have been preparing, then we are facing a race of super beings indeed, for we have known but little of their activities. What then, said Dallas, do you think is the purpose of those appendages? 
Those appendages, cilia, flagella, call them whatever you wish, are man-made tentacles created for the purpose of seizing, crushing, and destroying, then discarding. For a full two minutes the three men sat there, and horrible doubts flooded their brains, for the conclusion was obvious. The gens of Earth would go into action flying, not as organization inside an air car, but as individuals in swarms, myriads, legions and hordes, in order to do the utmost damage with their ray directors and atom disintegrators, they must approach within a reasonable distance, and the picture of those mighty tentacles, hurled like leashed lightning balls into the midst of the attackers, folding in individuals by scores and hundreds, crushing them and dropping them contemptuously, was horrible in the extreme to contemplate. It was difficult to estimate the possible speed of the air cars of the moon man, at least at this distance. Besides, perhaps not a single one of them was traveling at top speed, because of the fact of their crowded traffic. This thought passed through the minds of the three men. But we'll know, said Sarko Dali, when they get into action. For if I'm not mistaken, those aircars are being mustered on the rims of those craters to await orders, not to resist our attack, but to launch their own attack before we are ready. Dallas, are you going to allow your gents to go into action against these outsiders without the inspiration of a personal leadership? The nostrils of Dallas were quivering with the intensity of his motion. His vast egotism told him that he, Dalis, could successfully combat this air cars of the moon man, and he wished with all his heart to issue the orders to his gens. But vain as he was, he didn't even wish to have the appearance of acceding to the original plan of Sarga. Sarga had planned for Dalis to attack the dwellers of the moon, and Dalis had refused. Now, when this challenge of the air cars was a direct challenge to his genius as a potential warlord of Earth, and he wished to accept the challenge, he was turned two ways. Should he go ahead under the common leadership of the Sarkas, or should he still refuse battle, and perhaps see some lesser spokesman go forth to win glory and perishable renown to himself? A third message, a command almost, impinged on the brains of the three. I wish to speak with you aloud. The message was from Jaska. The three men rose and darted into the room of the master barrel. They had no sooner entered than the clear voice of Jaska sounded in the laboratory. Sarka, I am no traitor. I am Jaska who loves you. I am in the headquarters of Dalis at Ohi, and the gens of Dalis has indicated its allegiance to me having been informed by me that it is the wish of Dalis, whose presence is needed at the place of the master barrel. Command us, O Sarka, for we are ready to attack. There the voice ended, while the two Sarkas turned again to face Dalis. Sarka now was glad that Dalis knew the secret sign manual, and his fingers worked swiftly as he spoke to the rebel. Will you then, Dalis, allow your gents to be led to glory by a woman? A woman, moreover, who has duped you. The woman is a fool, said Dalis. She will lead the gents to destruction. Who then will be blamed if she does? Your gents believe she is the new spokesman at your wish. If they are told otherwise, they will think that Dalis himself is afraid to lead them. We shall see, said Dalis, if I could win honor by leading my gents in a successful attack against the moon man. How much greater will be my glory if Jaska attacks, is repulsed, and I go in to turn defeat into victory? Thus spake the colossal selfishness of Dalis, who took no thought of the possible, nay, certain, loss of countless lives because of his obstinacy. I suggest, he said, that you instruct your beloved Jaska to make ready, for if I am not mistaken, when we return to the observatory, we will discover that the air cars of the moon men have left their craters and are racing outward from the moon to meet us. Or perhaps you would lead my gents to safeguard Jaska. End of section 6